to thank uh, the West Indies, University of West Indies and the Caribbean and Youth Science Forum for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here for the first time in Trinidad Tobago in, in Port Spain. I uh, had had a wonderful 36 hours. Looking forward to the next 36 hours. And what I wanted to tell you a little bit today, uh, different from yesterday, is a, lot, a little bit about what kind of neuroscience I do, what kind of brain research I do, and which is not easy sometimes to define. But I'm going to, as usual, use my youngest son, Daniel, uh, as an example to tell you um, what do I do for a living uh, in, in two different places, in the United States and in my beloved Brazil. Well, one day my son was about seven, and he was in first, first grade, I think, in Chapel Hill in, in North Carolina, and the teacher was going around the class asking each one of the kids to tell what his or her dad does. And, you know, one is professor of a university, the other kid, my father is an engineer, the other, my father is a musician. When he got to Daniel, he looked very puzzled and said, ah, oh, okay, I know. My father is a rat neurosurgeon. <laughs> because he had been to the lab once and saw me doing these implants of things in the head of a rat, and he thought it was, uh, you know, the rats came from consultation, you know, to, to, to get implanted. Well, I, I heard that, and I said, no, Daniel, look, let's go to the lab and see what we really do. So I put this kid is very smart, very bright, and very cynical, uh, you know, in my biggest lab, and we were listening to these neurons firing for a couple hours in the dark with this graph that you see here flashing on the computer screen. And, um, and I told Daniel, these are electrical sparks coming from 100 cells. This is just 10 seconds that I showed him. I was showing him a continuous, you know, sequence of what I call, what we all call, a brainstorm, right? We all talk about brainstorms, but we rarely, if any, ever, we see or listening to one. So I put this thing in front of Daniel, and then I played this little soundtrack that was coming in real time from the head of a monkey that was learning to do a task. The monkey was searching for lights on a computer screen, and according to the color of the light, he had to move the arm to the right, or to the left, or to the front. So it's like driving in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where I come from. And they, t they tell you when you are 17, going to 18, and to, you know, the ambassador will relate to this, uh, the Brazilian ambassador. Uh, they tell you out of nothing, if you see red, you stop. This is in driving school. If you see green, you just go. But if you see yellow, you speed it up to beat the traffic light. <laughs> so you don't get a ticket, right? So yes, it's a universal law of driving. So my, my, I told my kid, see, if the monkey sees red, he's going to move the arm this way. If he sees yellow, he's going to go this way, and if he sees, I don't remember, blue, it goes straight. And I'm, you're going to hear now the brainstorm coming out of this monkey's head, and I can tell you, a hundred milliseconds ahead of time, one-tenth of a second ahead of time, where the monkey is going to move the arm. And I thought that that would impress that seven-year-old, right? So I play, I don't know if he's going to play because we didn't test it, but I need sound, if someone is controlling sound. Oh yeah, I'm controlling sound. <laughs> this is a brainstorm. So then you look at me and said, you know that this is like uh, popping popcorn in a microwave listening to a badly tuned IAM station. That's my own son. But that's what it is. And we train our ears, we neuroscientists, to actually listen to this. This is music for us. And we literally can tell what is about to happen because that's how the brain works. The brain plans ahead of time some action. So before I'm saying what I'm saying here, my plan has created a whole program, embed this program in these brainstorms, and send this out to the muscles of my larynx so my vocal cords can produce 
you know, the movements, they are ab appropriate for this kind of sound that I'm trying to convey to you in bed or in Portuguese speaking English. They always, I, I go to Brazil, they tell me that I have a, an American accent. I go to the United States, they tell me that I have a Brazilian accent, so I'm lost most of the time. <laughs> in any event, Daniel went back home, did some homework. The other day he went to school and went to the teacher and said, you know, I committed a mistake yesterday. I need to repair this to the class because my father is not a rat neurosurgeon. And he made a point to me that that's not what he does. The teacher was very happy because she didn't understand what a rat neurosurgeon does anyway. <laughs> and she said, okay, then why don't you tell the entire class now again what your dad does? And he was very proud. He stood up and said, my dad is a weatherman. <laughs> because I told him that I chase the storms. Electrical storms. It's just forgot to say that the storms that I am to after are these ones. You know, brain storms. And he didn't, of course he was seven. Later he, he hates when I tell this story, but, <laughs> he, and I tell it anyway. But uh, he learned, of course, and as uh, we all did, that these are very particular and very fundamental storms. They're you know, as beautiful as the ones we see on the sky, but more than that, they contain the essence of the most precious thing the Big Bang endowed us, and that's our human nature. They basically explain, although we don't know the explanation yet, or they are the core of the explanation of everything that we do as humans, not only individually, but you know, the record of our history as a species, the achievements of mankind, our predictions, our science, our art, our way to express our feelings, our emotions, our memories, our dreams, everything, every expectation that ever crossed the mind of a human being that ever existed was done through this language. We don't know the key of this language yet, but the first thing we decided to do as neuroscientists was to listen to the neurons. And as I said yesterday, uh, be very aware of what you carry between your ears. Because you carry between your ears 100 billion neurons connected. The same number of galaxies that exist in the universe is the only thing comparable to what you carry between the ears. Treat it well. Don't watch TV. So, and is that that we are after as neuroscientists? What is the Rosetta Stone of the brain? How do we find a way to decipher the alphabet and the language of these storms that it can explain what we are about. Well, to make a long story short, oops, yes, I hope it works now. Uh, I started working on this in 84 at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil where I did my PhD thesis. And again, as I said yesterday, in 88, when I finished my thesis and realized that I was not satisfied Although my, my thesis committee loved it, I was unhappy with what I had done because of the limitations of, of the tools we had available at that time. I went to my advisor and said, Dr. Caesar, I want to record hundreds of brain cells. And what I mean record is to listen to these electrical signals simultaneously because that's how I believe the brain works. The brain works as a democracy that is continuously voting. Each neuron has a vote. Some neurons have, you know, higher numbers of votes, like in, in real life, apparently. But they are continuously voting to produce a behavior, to produce an output. And I wanted to understand how this population of neurons interact. And at that time, the tools we had available in neuroscience only allowed us to record one cell at a time. I had to put an electrode, a very fine hair-like metal filament, in the head of something alive or anesthetized, most of the time, a rat, and listen to that electrical spark coming, that, like what you listen to. You listen to 100 cells firing, so the noise looks like popcorn. But I had to listen for five years to a single cell when I was a kid. And it was beautiful. It was really beautiful, but it was kind of poor. It's like trying to explain how the rainforest, the ecosystem of the rainforest works by going one tree at a time and characterizing one tree at a time and saying, okay, in 100 billion years, after I characterize the 100 billion trees that exist in the rainforest, I'm going to understand how it works. Because people thought it was all linear. 
that we just had to sum one tree at a time, or in this case, one neuron at a time, and I would explain how it works. And it turned out that is not how it works. And since science progresses slowly, we probably put 100 years, close to 100 years of our time on that. We learn a lot about individual cells, but we you know, couldn't make much sense of how a whole brain works. So at that point, after a little uh, stint in Philadelphia, when I met a great guy, John Chapin, who was my postdoctoral advisor, at the end of my postdoctoral uh, training, I was going to Duke University 20 years ago, this week, exactly. Uh, John and I came up with this idea. Well, how do we listen to this symphony, this real beautiful neuronal symphony that you just heard a little bit, a symphony that has no composer? There was no Mozart composing this symphony that just came through evolution. How do we make sense uh, of this symphony in a way that we can test some hypotheses, some theories on how populations of neurons operate? John and I had developed this technique to basically implant lots, not uh, now one, but lots of these hair-like filaments in the heads of behaving rats, and when I moved to Duke, behaving monkeys, to actually try to listen to more than the 25 cells that I got as a postdoc. That's when I finished four years of postdoctoral training, I went to 25 neurons simultaneously instead of one. And I, I'm telling this now to the young guys here, there will be scientists, they want the young students here. Imagine you have 25 neurons for the first time in history, you go to the largest neuroscience meeting in the United States, and the god of the field comes to your poster, you know, Vernon Montcastle, which was my hero when I was growing up as a scientist, and comes to me, but you, why are you recording 25 neurons? What is the point? Why is this better? And a, a poor Brazilian is standing there with this tall Virginian aristocrat, and he looked at me down, he had a, a beautiful tie, a suit, I had jeans and a t-shirt. This guy looked at me and said, why is this better? And I stopped for a second in my broken English and I said, well, it's 25 times better than what you have done. <laughs> I'm still alive. I still have a career. <laughs> so my lesson of this is when you're confronted by someone like that, just do your best to confront it back. It works. I'm here. So, and this was real. This was a, a real sentiment because people said, okay, you are going to record lots of cells, but what are you going to do with that? How are you going to analyze this data? How are you going to make any sense out of it? What are you going to actually do when you have these data sets? And that's what John and I were looking for four years. And we came up with this idea, and we call it a brain machine interface. And the idea was the following. If our theory is correct, to get all the technology that we had developed to record neurons simultaneously and connect this to electronics that allowed us to translate these electrical signals into digital commands. So we're looking into this electrical sound that you heard, you know, this storm, for the motor commands that animals produce one third of a second ahead of the movement uh, start to see if we could get these motor commands there send it to a robotic arm or a robotic leg that would actually move according to the desire of the animal that was there. And that we couldn't communicate with our monkeys. We tried very hard, but it was not easy. But what we did was to basically say, well, if the monkey understands that every time he thinks about moving his arm, because he learns to do that in our task you're going to see in a moment, but if he learns to do that, and we can move the robotic arm to do whatever the animal has to do, and the animal gets a reward, like a drop of orange juice, a Brazilian version, if possible, because it's the best. You know? If the Minister of Agriculture is in the audience, you should buy Brazilian orange juice. It's very good. <laughs> so, if the monkey loves to get his orange juice, and he gets to control the robotic arm to go there and get the orange juice for it, our hope was the monkey would understand that he, he doesn't need to move its own body anymore. It can relax its body, and it can just imagine what it wants to do, because we are going to read that thought, we are going to extract the motion command from there, we are going to make the robotic arm do what it needs to do, and the monkey will get what we call in my homeland a free Brazilian lunch. It's going to drink that juice without moving a muscle of its own body. 
Of course, when we send these things for you know, agencies to fund, they thought we had lost some screw. You know, we're kind of going crazy. But I'm going to show you that in the 15 years since the first uh, thing that we sent to NIH to get funded, we went from not getting funded to get a human being to do that in about 15 years. It's not too bad. You know, my, my soccer team has spent more than that not winning anything, so <laughs> I think it's okay. So let me show you how that does. Let me show you how this trick is accomplished. So if you don't understand this now, you won't understand anything else. I'm wasting a lot of time here, but I guess time is uh, now relative. Uh, but you need to understand the concept of a brain-machine interface. So a monkey needs to do a movement, whatever movement. Let's say move the arm. We are recording the brain activity related to that command of moving the arm ahead of the movement. We are rerouting the signals that uh, describe the movement, transforming them in digital commands to a robotic device that does the movement for the monkey and sends a message to the brain telling the brain that, OK, I'm achieving what you want. So the monkey realizes that he can rely on this loop, this brain machine loop, to do whatever he needs for the foreseeable future. OK? That's what we projected in 1988. 1980, I'm sorry, 1997. So let me show you Aurora now, introduce you Aurora, my favorite monkey to this day. Aurora was the first one in which we implanted about 100 filaments to record her brain activity and try to see if she would do this. So Aurora was trained to use her arm to move this joystick and play a video game. And the video game consisting of very quickly putting this little computer cursor inside of this target that appears randomly in different locations of the screen. And every time that target goes to the, uh, the, the cursor goes to the target, Aurora gets a drop of juice, orange juice. And for that drop of orange juice, Aurora will do anything for you. She really wants to drink that. So look at how, how proficient Aurora became in playing this game. So she is moving her arm. She's going there. Every time she crosses, she gets a juice. And as a good primate, she's trying to cheat. She's trying to guess it. Sometimes she gets it, but it's 32 different locations. She cannot do by chance alone. And she soon realized that she has to focus on getting the dot inside the target. While we are recording the brain activity of Aurora, we are running this through mathematical models that I don't want to bother you with this. And we discover that we could get lots of motor commands out of this brainstorm and route this to a robotic arm so that Aurora could actually play the video game without moving her arm. And we didn't know if this would work at all, of course. But 10 minutes after this video was, was uh, uh, acquired, the, the previous video, we played a trick with Aurora. We removed the joystick. We turn on the brain machine interface. So Aurora now imagined that she has to move the arm, but all the brain information that we are recording from 100 neurons go to this mathematical model running a computer, and in less than a third of a second, goes to a robotic arm that now controls the cursor that you're going to see. So this image was the first ever of a monkey controlling a device without moving its body, just thinking about and getting it done. Thank you. In the beginning, it is slow because think about it. This is the first time a brain has liberated itself from the physical domains of a body and is acting in the world through a device, a device that the monkey is not even seeing. The, the monkey only knows that something is moving the cursor and the juice is coming. So she just goes. <laughs> She goes to a point in which she drinks 400 ml of juice an afternoon for a thousand trials of this. She loves it. And she, she let you know that she loves it because Rizzo's monkeys vocalize pleasure. So she coos like a baby, telling you, I'm enjoying this. Keep it going, you know? <laughs> so what Aurora didn't know is that in the other room, there was a robotic arm being controlled by this brain activity. And it was the hand of the robotic arm that was controlling the cursor. So this is 30 days later where Aurora realizes that she can play the game using her brain to control the joystick, but she has not lost the function of her biological arms by no means. 
She can still scratch her back, scratch one of us, get fruits that we put next to her because she can use the biological arms and the robotic arm at the same time. So in 2002, when we saw this result, we postulated that very likely what was happening is that the brain of Aurora was assimilating this robotic arm as an extension of her own body. Because we all carry maps of our own body inside our brains. As we gain weight, lose weight, even when we lose a piece of our body, a finger, an arm, or a leg through a, an accident, an amputation, our brains in 90% of these patients continue to produce the sensation that the missing part of the body is still there. It's called the phantom limbs phenomenon. So people come to you, and I saw that as a physician, saying, look, I have pain in this arm. And you look, and there is no arm. But the person has real pain. When you measure everything you can measure about pain, the patient has a real sensation of pain that is created inside the head of the patient. The, the patient is not uh, mentally ill at all. The patient is experiencing real pain because the brain insists that there is a missing, uh, the missing part of the body is still there. So that was what we postulated, that Aurora probably, after a month of playing with this, just thought that she had an extra arm, which is, you have to admit, pretty convenient, you know? For monkeys and for us. Well, let's move it 12 years later. This was just published, our, our paper just published three days before we went to the World Cup uh, stadium. So we didn't even see because we we're so crazy that we didn't even notice. But 10 years later, we have done this now in a much larger scale, 10 times more neurons, almost 20 times more neurons, and all wirelessly. So this is a, a helmet that we put to protect the monkey so the monkey doesn't put the hands inside the implants. It's just to protect, it's like a football, American football helmet, you know, to protect, because monkeys love to play with each other and hit their heads just to play around. That's not good for electronics, you know? It doesn't help, but this is, uh, a new technique that allows us to record close to 2,000 neurons right now. In 10 years, we went from 100 to 2,000, and that has a lot of interesting advantages. For instance, this is all the wireless electronics. This is uh, a cousin of Aurora that now plays the same game in our lab wirelessly. Look that she's controlling this cursor and drinking the juice, without being sitting in a chair, without having any cables, and she's playing the same game. Much quicker, much more efficient, because now she's playing with 500 neurons, generating the output, okay? But Cherry, this monkey, I think, she thinks that this is kind of boring, it's just for old monkeys like Aurora. She actually wants to do something more exciting, like controlling a wheelchair. So she goes there and wirelessly moves the wheelchair in the lab, using brain activity. This was a year ago. Well, when I get back home a month ago, or close to a month ago, no, three weeks ago, my students said that Cherry had climbed another level. She was now driving the wheelchair inside the wheelchair, wirelessly. So these are the three positions from where Cherry can come in the lab. This is a camera from the top. We drop uh, grapes in this uh, uh, location here, and when she sees the grapes, she drives the wheelchair mentally to actually get there and be able to grasp the grapes. And I'm going to show you from the front now. You see that she doesn't care about anything in life but the grapes. <laughs> That's a job I like to have, you know? And she goes there, and basically she's driving these motors by imagining ahead of time what is the trajectory that she has to make to get there, and she does. Well, I'm sure that you already thought that this can be expanded very quickly, and that could have very important clinical implications. This is another monkey, is our now champion, uh, Mango, who has been with us for almost a decade. And Mango controls an avatar of itself. And he controls both hands of the avatar to play the same game that Aurora was playing, but now, to get their juice, Mango has to put both hands inside of these two solid figures that appear on the screen. So he has to coordinate both hands to do that. It's the only way you get the juice. And what we learned, as I had taught way back in 89, 
is that to coordinate both hemispheres to do this job, you cannot simply sum one neuron, another neuron, another neuron. It doesn't work. It's not linear. You have to have a large population working together because it's extremely nonlinear. And the way you approach this problem would never work if you had only one electrode recording one neuron at a time. So we are getting a little closer to the feeling that the brain has to be watched or has to be studied, investigated in a different way than we had before. Well, this is basically what I told you so far is how to get signals from the brain to send it to a device. But this is only half of the way we actually do things when we move, are sending feedback to my brain telling me that this is very good Trinidad Tobago wood, <laughs> that I'm really safe, you know, walking here because I can feel that it can sustain my weight. I know where my knees are, I know where my feet are, I don't know where my time zone is, but I know the proprioceptive feedback from my body is coming. If I would get rid of this, as in some diseases that we all know in medicine, when the proprioceptive feedback is removed for a lesion in the spinal cord or lesions in the periphery of the nerves, I would not be able to walk. If I close the eyes, because vision could help me, but if I close the eyes, I would fall right here. In fact, there's a famous disease that doesn't exist in most of the planet anymore, but a quaternary syphilis destroys the fibers here in the spinal cord, and you know the patient, you don't need to do any exam if a patient has that, because you call the patient to your office as a physician, as I did when I was a 26-year-old, 24-year-old, and the patient comes to your office stamping the ground, because he has to hear the ground, otherwise he falls. So you ask the patient to close the eyes, he starts swaying because he cannot, he cannot feel the ground. And then when you do the diagnosis without any test at all. So when we did this uh, four years ago, we knew that we could do, as you saw, uh, control a robotic arm, but we wanted to actually send feedback directly to the brain to close the loop. And we didn't want to send feedback just through the skin. We wanted to see if we could establish a dialogue with the brain using the language that the brain actually likes, electricity. So we designed a protocol to code tactile information or feedback in terms of patterns of very tiny electrical pulses that we deliver to the same electrodes to the region of the brain that uh, receives feedback from the skin. It's called the somatosensory uh, cortex, but don't, don't worry about the term. So what we did was to establish that the motor signals would go to the robotic arm, and the robotic arm, or in this case, is a virtual arm, is an avatar of arm, it's cheaper and easier to use. But every time this, av this avatar arm does something, like exploring an object with its avatar fingers, the contact of the avatar arm on the surface sends feedback directly to the cortex. And we ask the question, can the monkey learn to interpret this artificial touch as it does with its own fingertips. Can we give a few weeks to this monkey and they, all of a sudden, learn how to do that? And I wouldn't be talking about that if I, it hadn't worked, right? But this is the task. The monkey is here using the brain activity to control an avatar of itself. The hand of the avatar is in a virtual space, a space inside of a computer that we created. And there are three round objects, three spheres. And these spheres are identical to each other. They look like gray stuff. The only way you can find the difference between the spheres is if you use your virtual fingers to touch the surface, because each one of them has a different texture. One is like sandpaper, is rough. The other is like metal, very smooth and cold. And the other is in between. It's a transition between the two. So the, the spheres keep changing position in the, in the space. And there's only one object that if the animal captures the correct object, let's say the one that looks like, that feels like sandpaper, if the animal touches that object, it gets orange juice, the famous orange juice, or any other juice, because each monkey, we give the juice that they like the most. The first thing the monkey does in the lab is a juice test. 
and we find which one they like. Some like cranberry, others like orange juice. You know, that's the, the first thing they do. So what I'm going to show you is a monkey, again, mango, using the brain to move an avatar arm, touching different objects, and selecting the correct object. Because the objects look like this. The animal has to put their hand in this gray zone where there is a feedback information, there is the texture, and when it touches that with the avatar arm, electrical pulses that are proportional to the texture are delivered to the cortex directly. And now we can do that wireless too. And you deliver that as our brains acquire signals, and when the animal feels the right texture, it has to put the hand in the middle of the object. And if it does that correctly, it gets oranges. So look at the mango doing that. What you're going to hear, if the sound is OK, you're going to hear the background is the brainstorm, some neurons that we are recording. Then every time Mango gets the right object, you're going to hear a high frequency pitch showing that she got, he got the correct uh, object. And there is some noise about the reward when he gets it right. So I'm, I'm going to tell you that. So the objects are here. <laughs> That's the correct target. He's exploring. This ping is when he got it right. The other sound is the electrical signal being delivered to the brain of the animal. Like now. That's the electrical signal. He got it right. The legends are only for you. And besides, monkeys don't read English. So there's no problem. See, the, he's controlling the hand with the hand, with the brain. And he's exploring the texture with virtual fingers. And every time these virtual fingers touch the object, a proportion of electrical current goes directly to the brain of the animal. And the animal learns to use this to a point that in 30 days, they are doing this as well as if they are using their real fingers. But this is a virtual finger. It doesn't exist. It's a computer program. Okay. So the brain is capable of adapting, of changing itself to a point in which it learns to interpret whatever signal we send to the brain. In fact, I like to say, in fact, if you're taking notes, the students don't need to take any notes because I told already Christine that the famous Susan that was mentioned this morning, I talked to her last night and she's going to send a copy of my book to every one of you. So you're going to have the entire story to read, so don't worry. <laughs> the only condition for the gift is that if you go to Brazil, you root for Palmeiras. <laughs> and in the next World Cup, you root for Brazil if Trinidad Tobago doesn't make it, of course. <laughs> we need every help we can get right now. So. What I say in the book is that the brain is like an orchestra that as it plays its music, the brainstorms that you heard, as it plays this music, the music itself changes the very instruments that are producing the music. Every note, every brainstorm that the brain produces changes the way the neurons talk to each other. So we're in continuous flux. Our brains are continuously dynamic. So the, there was an old saying in Brazil that old dogs don't learn new tricks. That's not true. Neuroscience has disproved that. We learn until we die. We learn in less speed as we get older, but we learn because the brain never stops learning continuously. Even these monkeys can learn how to use these virtual arms to do important tasks. So at that point, we ask ourselves, 2007, what is the limit of liberating a brain from a body? What is the physical limit that we, how far can we take this, okay? And of course, when you get a neuroscientist and a roboticist and a computer scientist in the same room with some Kuiperians, things get kind of crazy. So I was one day with my, one of my best friends, Gordon Sheng, that you're going to see in a moment. And he's Australian, but he's, he was born in Macau. And he worked in Japan, and now he's in Germany. So the guy is kind of crazy. 
and we are together and we are discussing because Gordon has just built this beautiful humanoid robot. It was the most advanced humanoid robot in 2007. And his name was CB1, Computational Brain 1. It was a, it's an amazing hydraulic machine that can do everything with one exception. It's prepared to walk, to move the arms. It has all these legs and articulations, joints, beautiful, but it doesn't have a brain. So I, I was in that meeting with, in Brazil, in Natal, actually, where we have our institute with Gordon. I said, Gordon, what about if I lend you a brain? And he stopped drinking, looking at me, and said, what do you mean? I said, well, I have these monkeys in the United States that are learning how to walk on treadmills. Because if you basically give support to the body, to the monkey, the monkey walks like us. They don't like it, they like to walk in the floor, but if they're upright and they're getting juice, they will walk. <laughs> I, every time I go to Brazil and I talk to you know, large uh, public audiences, I look at the wives in the audience and say, if that primate is not working, give it orange juice. <laughs> you may as well try, right? And we can predict, using the brain activity, the locomotion of the monkeys ahead of time. 300 milliseconds before the monkey steps moving the leg, I know which leg is going to move at which velocity and how long is going to be the step. And Gordon said, well, what, what the, does that help me? I said, well, you are a computer scientist too. Why don't you create an internet connection between Duke and Kyoto so we send you the brain signals in real time and get your robot walking under the control of a primate brain. And then you improve you a little bit your connection, and you send me footage, video footage, of the legs walking in Japan so I can project in front of my monkey, and the monkey will only get the reward that he craves if the robotic leg moves correctly, not its own leg. And you know, at three in the morning, everything sounds plausible, you know? <laughs> and it took us three years, but in 2007, that's exactly what we did. You're going to see very quickly, because of course I'm running out of time, but uh, I want you to show the whole story. Uh, but what happened is, not only the monkeys learn to move CB1, first suspended in the air, and then on the ground in Japan in real time, but we realized that after they got going, and they were being rewarded every time the robotic leg uh, touched the ground in Japan, we could turn off the treadmill. They could stop walking, and they could still imagine the locomotion pattern to keep the robot walking, as long as they got the juice. More than that, this transcontinental trip from the east coast of the United States to Japan and back was 20 milliseconds faster than it took for the electrical signal the monkeys had to reach its own leg. So, when both devices were walking, the robot in Japan was touching the ground 20 milliseconds before the monkey's own foot touched the ground in the United States. So we are a little faster than the biology that makes locomotion happen. So this is just so you see one of the last experiments we did where CB1 finally got the holy or the most desirable feat of any humanoid robot ever built, to walk freely under the control of a female monkey. So these were the first steps using brain activity coming from that you know, monkey to get CB1 walking in Kyoto. As you can imagine, this gave us ideas. Ideas actually that we had had before with John Chapin back in 2002. We published this in Scientific America in an article in 2002, and we suggested before the, this robot experiment had been done, that if brain-machine interfaces would grow as we predicted they would, and as developments would improve the technology and the number of neurons that we can record, it was conceivable that in patients that suffer a severe spinal cord injury that makes the patient paralyzed below the level of the injury, that we could use this technology one day in the future to create a bypass. And we actually use these uh, words. We could actually bypass the lesion by creating a robotic suit that would encase the patient or the patient would wear, and that the brain activity collected by this brain-machine interface 
would allow the patient to imagine movements and make this robotic device carry the paralyzed body in liberating this patient from the prison of being confined to a wheelchair or any other uh, device. Of course, in 2002, people thought that we had lost the last marble we had in our heads. And uh, everybody said that this was crazy, that, you know, but we were used at that point. In 2008, we created this consortium called the Walk Again Project. And these are just the initial members. Uh, we started with Gordon that had moved to Munich. Uh, our friend Honey Bloor in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. Of course, the Duran, the Center for Neuro Engineering, and the institute that I had created in Natal. These were the founding members that decided to put all that they had together, the limit of their imagination and the limit of their technology and, and scientific uh, achievements together, forgetting patents, forgetting any company, any limit of anything. This is on a non-profit basis to see if we could achieve exactly what I'm telling you. Uh, later on, other universities in the United States join us, particularly Colorado State, which, uh, whose vice president for research is my best friend, Alan Rudolph, who basically almost quit his job, or, or they almost quit him, to join us for almost six months to work on this thing uh, in Brazil. And this is what the Walk Again project became in the last eight months. About 156 people 25 countries and all over five continents. It turned out that the company in Paris that helped us to put all this exo together that you're going to see in a moment had engineers from Morocco, Tunisia. Uh, so we had a great group of African engineers working with us. And we also had Gordon from Australia and people from all over the world, you can see here. So we got together. And I think I told you briefly this story. Uh, after Brazil was awarded the World Cup, we are working already, but after Brazil was awarded the World Cup, in, uh, there was this desire to showcase to the world that Brazil was more, thank God, more than football <laughs> and, and music, right? <laughs> that we had much more to offer because for the past decade, a lot of interesting things have happened in Brazil, and it's a different country, completely different from the time I left Brazil in 89. You know, we used to have, uh, when I was a professor at the University of Sao Paulo, every time you, got, you get your paycheck, you would go and buy everything you needed in half an hour after you get your paycheck, because inflation was 1100 a year. And we joke in Sao Paulo that when you get to the restaurant to get a pizza, you buy two beers, because by the time you finish the pizza, the second beer would be more expensive, you know? <laughs> so when I go home now, people complain about inflation of 6.5% a year, and I say, no, guys, you're joking with me, you know? This is a, a completely different country. And if you don't know, 45 million people came out of the poverty line in the last 12 years. It's a big social revolution that happened there. It's a completely new country. So I wanted, as a Brazilian in exile, go back to Brazil, what I had done already in 2004, but I wanted to be part of a different idea. And the idea was, let's show that Brazil is much more than the stereotype out there. Let's have a scientific demonstration on the opening ceremony of the World Cup. And let's have the first time in history that the kickoff of the World Cup that everybody follows in the world is given by a paraplegic man or woman that kicks a ball using an exoskeleton controlled by the brain machine interface. Now think about me, poor me, telling the president of Brazil what I just said. <laughs> I'll repeat. Instead of having just people dancing and singing and whatever, let's have a paraplegic Brazilian standing upright using his mind to move a piece of machinery to kill, kick a ball and to feel it, to be able to experience for the first time after the accident that made him paraplegic, that he can go there as any other Brazilian kid and play football. Well, to my surprise, the president of Brazil signed it on. And we just said, OK, now we better do it. You know? <laughs> because we only had 17 months. And that, if you think that that's a plenty of time to build an exoskeleton, 
to build a brain machine interface that has never been built before, to get eight patients to commit and work really hard from six months to learn everything they had to learn to do that, think again. You know? If I knew what I know now, I probably would not have that meeting with the president of Brazil. <laughs> In any event, we went out talking about this. The Brazilian government funded the whole enterprise. It's the largest scientific uh, neuroscience grant ever awarded by the Brazilian federal government. It's 13 million dollars for four years to get this, but we had to demonstrate this in 16, 17 months, you know? By the time we were underway, uh, Scientific American, the, you know, a, a scientific journal that you all know for propagating science for 100 years, you know, chose the Walk Again project as one of the 10 projects that go beyond the limits of science. But none of the other nine had a deadline <laughs> to actually show something. So we start working on this, and that was a distributed enterprise. Uh, of course, we had my center at Duke work on the basic science and the building the interface. We all uh, work with other countries to build the exoskeleton. I'm going to show it to you. We had our institute in Natal. This is our future new building that is almost ready. Next year is uh, uh, 14,000 square meters, uh, 140,000 square feet, dedicated to neurorobotics. You probably never heard about this, but it exists. And it exists in Brazil, northern Brazil, not in Sao Paulo, our New York, but in the middle of nowhere, as they say, that Natal is located. It's a beautiful nowhere. I recommend you visit, you know? <laughs> in any event, we went to work, and we built a neuro lab, a neuro robotics lab in Sao Paulo, because all the patients were from Sao Paulo, and the opening game was going to happen, as I said yesterday, in the wrong stadium in Sao Paulo. So we had to be there. Otherwise, it would be too difficult to move the patients around the country. It's a big country. So we start doing prototypes at Duke with monkeys, and we start building this laboratory in Brazil and work 24 hours continuously. Because by the time the team in Brazil was going to bed, the European team was getting there to continue to work. And by the time they were going to bed, the American team was going up. And we rotated, and sometimes we lost who was in bed and who was working because we went for 24, 36 hours in a row. And we didn't have any idea where we were at that point. And it was the best thing I ever did in my life. I can tell you, I recommend that too. <laughs> so this is how the exoskeleton that is called Brazil Santos Dumont I, honoring the greatest Brazilian uh, scientist ever, the guy who actually flew for the first time, in Paris, in front of a million people on October 19, 1901, this guy invented control flight. He bought a balloon, he put an engine in the back of this dirigible, he invented the concept of navigation, of pitch, and, and wings, and flaps, and he actually created the first airship that could be controlled by men. So imagine, on a Saturday morning, this guy flew from the Bois de Boulogne all the way around the Eiffel Tower and came back to the same place he took off. So Paris exploded. Was, he was the first celebrity of the world. You know, he's forgotten, of course, because other guys in America invented a plane that is a specific case of control flight. But control flight was invented by a South American flying in front of the world in Paris, and we know that down there. So the exoskeleton works like that. You collect brain activity not anymore with uh, invasive electrodes in the head, but with a cap, like a baseball cap, that you record from the surface of the skin of the head, the skull. So you can get the electrical signals, not as good, but we can handle it. These signals capture the desire of the patient to start walking, to move, or to kick. And ahead of time, since the, this is a little delay, it's not as good as the intracranial, but we still have a delay, these signals go to a computer in the backpack, and the computer activates the joints necessary to fulfill the desire of this patient. It happens, though, that the entire exoskeleton I'm going to show you has these tiny little sensors for pressure, contact, and temperature. And they're always spread in the legs, forming like an artificial skin. And this sends feedback to a shirt that a patient wears. 
So every time the, the, the patient moves the leg and touches the ground, when it touches the ground, that pressure is delivered to the skin of the patient's arm. So the patient learns to feel his or her legs with the arms, because the arms are still uh, have sensitivity. The legs don't. They don't feel anything. And you're going to see what the implication of that is. So we basically close the loop. And we got this going. So this is the first uh, lower part of the exoskeleton. You can see the hip, the knee, and the ankle. It's a beautiful piece of machinery. It's all hydraulic, so it's very quiet. And, and it's better than just electrical motors because when you use hydraulic, the movement is very smooth. It looks like one of us walking. And it doesn't make a big amount of noise, so the patient is not scared of this uh, prosthetic device. Well, we kept working. You can see that it's Brazilian. You know, there's a clear indication, <laughs> right? This is where the backpack goes. You can see a little bit of the movement of the hip here. And this is when we got to Brazil. In uh, March of this year, this is the full exoskeleton with the hydraulic generators in the back. These are the actual motors that provide the force uh, that make the joints move. This is the thing that we took to the pitch on June 12. And you can see here, these are the pictures of the 155, 56 people that work on the project. Then the back pack behind the patient, like giving a little hand, you know, to this guy to go walk. But this is engineering. You can see from the side here, this is all engineering. It's very difficult. It's very complicated. This is one of our patients, one of the first tests. But the most challenging thing, of course, was to get these patients to learn how to interact with this machine, because it had never been done. So it can get all sorts of signals, but and it can use this artificial skin. This is what I mentioned to you. This, each one of these is a pressure, temperature, and position location sensor. We can put this in this plastic material. And we can put, for instance, in the heel of the shoes of the exo, we can put the sensor. So we know when the heel touches the ground, when the toes touch the ground. So we spread all over. This is how we put in the shoes of the exo, these elements. And this is just so you have an idea how they work. So this is a friend of mine moving the shoe on the table, and you can see the signals of pressure being generated on the computer. What happens is that we send these signals to the surface of the arm. It's like a t-shirt with long sleeves that has micro-vibrating elements all over the sleeve. So as the signals that you see are generated, they go to the skin. And the brain of the patients, if you do that, even one of us, if we do that, we stand and I I fake these signals to your arms. In about a minute, you're going to have the sensation that you're walking. Particularly if I put a goggle in virtual reality, I'm going to show you now, and I show an avatar of you walking, and the stepping on the ground is synchronized with these sensors sending signals to your arm. Uh, you may know this guy. One day we were in the lab, and this former football player called Ronaldo came to visit us. And I said, you know, I want to check this out. Is this for real? So we put Ronaldo, phenomenal, you know, this big guy, in a virtual reality environment, like standing like this, with a goggle that show a Ronaldo walking on the soccer pitch, and we put the sleeves with the sensors. In about 30 seconds, Ronaldo say, I'm running. I'm feeling that I'm running. But he was standing. He was not moving. And he was shocked. You know, he, he couldn't believe that the sensation was like that. So during the World Cup, I'm going to show you in a moment, Ronaldo was on TV broadcasting for Brazil and say, I know what these guys are doing. I were there. I was there and I felt it. You know, I know exactly what's going on. So this is what the first phase of training for our patients happened. This is in a virtual reality football stadium. Since we knew that we were going to go to a stadium, we put in a room these huge loudspeakers that produces noise coming from the loudest soccer fans, football fans that we could find in the world. And that happened to be, you won't believe in this, the Turkish. You know? <laughs> when we compare Brazilians, Germans, Argentinians, Bolivians, the Turkish got up there. It's unbelievable the amount of noise they make. <laughs> and we put our patients in these, uh, you're going to see in a moment, these uh, robots. And they had to control the movements of this avatar, a 
avatar player in the middle of this noise with lights flashing all over as if they were in a football stadium. And you're going to hear exactly what they heard and you're going to see what they did mentally with this avatar. Oops. Is it the Turkish? So the patients were able to do the entire sequence, standing up, walking, and actually kicking a real Brazilian kick, not what you saw in, on TV. This is real, you know? <laughs> that was fake. Once they graduated from this, once they graduated from the virtual reality room, it took a month, they actually, for the first time in years, were able to walk again. This is a commercially available robot. And what you see here is the first time that Eric, this patient, was able to walk again. He's controlling the robot with his brain activity. You can see the cap here in his head. And the robot is obeying his command to walk. If you want, you can see a detail of his foot down here. And for someone who was in a wheelchair for 10 years, this is real. You know, this is very real. This was the second level training. This robot is static. It cannot go out, but it has to basically be controlled by the brain in this stage. And they got it. All eight got it. Once we saw that, we realized that they could graduate to Santos Dumont. So this is the first time Santos Dumont moved in Brazil. Not the aviator, the robot. And for us, it was very, very emotional because, of course, we never seen this moving before. I don't know if this movie is going to work because this is a huge movie, a movie, and this is an old little computer, and it has a soundtrack because I, le I have to tell you. You think the scientists, most of you may have this impression, the scientists work from nine to five, they go home, they have dinner, they read a book, they do some math equations, you know. <laughs> they put the dog out, they go home, they go to bed, and they wake up the next morning. It's not like that. If you're looking for that kind of job, try something else. Because science is completely out of the ordinary, it's totally for most people and for people doing things that really need to happen. You are there at the crazy hours. You are there you know, with things that don't work most of the time. But one day work, you celebrate in unusual ways. <laughs> so this is my Puerto Rican student with a bunch of Tunisian engineers at 3 in the morning when we actually got this thing to walk on the ground, just with the controllers first, without a patient. And I was there dying because we had gone for I don't know how many hours, not, not eating. It was hot like hell. It was a summer in Sao Paulo, you know. And by the way, this, by chance, this laboratory was built 800 meters from the house where I grew up. So I was back in my neighborhood after 30 years. By chance, I didn't design this. I didn't decide where the lab was going to happen. So I was there remembering all these years playing soccer on the streets, and here I am inside a bunker with a robot that doesn't want to work. <laughs> and this is the first time we put this thing on the ground, and it happened. <laughs>
possible. Synchronized to perfection, the music. So, it was a little celebration because for us in late May, late April, I'm sorry, this was looking like impossible. You know, we were running out of time, but then we got it to work. We got it to get all the robots working, but there was something missing, of course. The patients had gone through all the training that I mentioned to you. They were able to control that commercially available robot, but we had to put them in this machine. And it happened. And it happened to all eight. Every one of them did it. And this is just to show you what we had planned for the entire ceremony of the World Cup. And this is one of our patients who is controlling with the mind, you can see the lights here. This is the sign that the EEG is working. And you can see the first steps. People are there just for safety. They're not really doing much. They're just there to keep the patient uh, calm, to be sure that you know we are there. And we always had the safety in the lab because, of course, you were just starting with this thing. But these movements are triggered and this is the first kick. And you can see the lights coming up. He's making the decision. And he kicked. I took the sound off because everybody's screaming, go, you know? <laughs> Because everybody, you know, everybody was very moved. And he's telling us how he is to kick a ball after seven years, close to seven years, you know, and to feel it. Well, we had planned this, all this thing. We went to the stadium, and now I can introduce you to Gordon, famous Gordon, who was the coordinator of this exoskeleton building process that counted with 20 other engineers in Germany and France and in Brazil. You see that he's... Shorter than the machine, you know? <laughs> but he's a phenomenal guy. This is in the stadium. This is in one of the rehearsals. The first time a robotic device was put in a soccer field and tested 10 days before the opening. Uh, I want you to also to know Suleiman, my former PhD student, uh, who was born in Afghanistan, grew up in Italy, went to school in Switzerland, got his PhD in America, in my lab, and he's now a professor in the Natal Institute in Brazil. <laughs> and it was Suleiman who was chosen by the entire group, because of obvious reasons, to be the guy who placed the ball in front of the EXO during the opening ceremony of the World Cup. And I cannot show you that footage because you don't believe in this, but it's the full truth. FIFA doesn't allow me. FIFA didn't give me the footage to anybody. Not even the Brazilian government has the official footage because during the ceremony, to our shock, they had promised us 30 seconds of camera to show the entire demo. And the entire demo it was supposed to be, as you're going to see in a rehearsal here, a few minutes before we went to the field. Juliano was to be there. The ball was to put place, a place in front of him, and he would do the mental uh, maneuver to move the leg and kick the ball. And he did. And we saw, I was just behind him. And of course, we are so, because we are with the patients there, 25 of us plus the eight patients on this side of the pitch, the president of Brazil above us, the lady who signed on this thing for us to do, she saw it. But they didn't tell us anything. And by the time we did this demonstration, we learned an hour later, because we're so out of communication with anybody at that point, that they only show a few seconds on the TV, just a few seconds, when they had agreed to show the full 30 seconds that the demonstration took. When they told me that we had 30 seconds, I said, it's impossible to do. 
no robotics demonstration can be done in 30 seconds. That doesn't exist, but we did it. We were able to make it. In fact, we train in the stadium more than the Brazilian team, apparently. <laughs> for one week. It's true, I'm not saying any news, am I? We trained for a full week, and I can report to you that we did 55 kicks. And out of 55 kicks, 54 worked perfectly, which is, again, better than the Brazilian team. <laughs> so if you promise not to tell FIFA, I'm going to show you what um, Alan Rudolph, my best friend, captured in his cell phone 10 minutes before we went to the field, the last rehearsal. You know, because, of course, robotics is complicated. We're using a brain control robot. Something can go wrong. We don't ever know. And we are in front of, in theory, a billion people. Not to mention the 70,000 people. I can tell you, walking to that stadium was one of the greatest experiences of my life, with all these people cheering us up. Because, as I said yesterday, the most amazing thing, independently of FIFA, I don't care about FIFA, <laughs> independently of these guys, the land of football, the country that invented the beautiful game, not the British, forget them, you know? <laughs> the land who really, which really invented this thing was talking about science before the World Cup. It was everywhere. People wanted to see the kick. People wanted to see a Brazilian piece of science, a gift of Brazilian science to the world, to all the 25 million people out there that need hope to continue to believe that they will walk again, and that's what we want to do. So Alan took this because we wanted to do a last test. And what you're going to see is the, the entire color show that we had prepared to show to the entire world that they miss when they show on the opening. You see the blue thing is that Giuliano, when Giuliano rests his arms on the platform here of the exo, the exo turns on. They are sensors in that platform that sense the presence of his arms. And then the entire exo pulsates blue. And that pulsation means that Giuliano can control the movements of the exo, and the exo can send feedback to him. When Giuliano takes the mental decision to do the kick, you're going to see these flashes of green and yellow light coming from the head to the leg. And then the leg kicks and the exo goes into red explosion, okay? <laughs> and that's what we prepared over six months. It doesn't matter that it didn't come out all on TV. What matters is this. You see the pulsation? Suleiman is about to put the ball. He took the decision. Look at that. There's a little glitch in the video, but he kicks. So, the main lesson of all this that I told you tonight is that, as I said yesterday, sometimes, rarely, but sometimes, impossible dreams actually happen. The idea of a brain machine interface started in 1996 on a little restaurant next to a gas station on a road in the outskirts of Philadelphia, United States, where John Chapin and I were sitting eating one of those famous Philly cheesesteaks that are one foot long, surrounded by truck drivers, because that's the most famous, you know, cheesesteak joint in Philadelphia. And John and I were debating what to do to explain our theory on how the brain works. And John and I say, okay, one of us, I don't remember who, said, Let's connect brains to machines, and let's make machines move controlled by the brain. And a truck driver behind us say, that's a good idea. <laughs> but we had absolutely nothing. We had nothing. We had no money. We had no idea how to do it. We had only the sheer passion of one day getting there. And uh, what I'd like to tell you is, as a Brazilian neuroscientist who grew up in a place very similar to this one, beautiful, wonderful, 
full of sunshine, full of interesting lives and interesting stories, full of problems that need to be solved. We all know. What I want to tell you, particularly to the young guys here, never ever is stop when someone tells you that you cannot fulfill whatever impossible dream you have. They will always tell you that. Just go for it, because one day you'll get done. Thank you.